Welcome to today's program titled Developments and Strategies in the Current Landscape of DEI Programs. At this time, all participants are in a listen only mode. For those of you who are logged into the web presentation, you are encouraged to submit questions throughout the conference by typing them into the Q&A box on the right hand side of your screen. For those interested in obtaining CLE credit for this webinar, later in the presentation, we will read the CLE attendance verification code. Please write this code down as it will not be reread and it is required on the CLE credit request form. During the program, you will see a slide with a QR code that you may scan to access and submit your request for CLE credit. You can also find a link to the form in the connection details email you received this morning. Copies of the webinar recording and materials will be distributed to all attendees in the days following the webinar. On the next slide, you will see a legal disclaimer. This presentation has been prepared by Seifarth Shaw LLP for informational purposes only. The material discussed during this webinar should not be construed as legal advice or a legal opinion on any specific facts or circumstances. The content is intended for general information purposes only, and you are urged to consult a lawyer concerning your own situation and any specific legal questions you may have. At this time, I would like to turn it over to our first speaker for today's program, Lauren Paris Watts. Lauren, please go ahead. Thanks, Kate. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lauren Paris Watts, and I'm joined today by my colleagues Dave Boffa and Liz Humphrey. For those who don't already know Dave, he's a partner in our Chicago office. Liz practices in our Houston office, and I practice in Seattle. All three of us are employment attorneys who are part of CIFARC's longstanding diversity and inclusion practice group, and we feel fortunate to have a few minutes to talk to you this today about our favorite topic, DEI, or one of our favorite topics, DEI. Over the past year, uh, um, Kate, would you please go to the next slide? Thank you. Over the past year, DEI programs have been under attack. Um, there has been an uptick in claims challenging certain DEI initiatives. We've seen these challenges from one of two groups. The first, kind of the traditional single and multiple multiple um, plaintiff claims brought by folks who are seeking damages related to kind of quote unquote reverse discrimination. And the second, um, which has been much more active over this past year, is a group comprised of well-funded um, advocacy groups seeking injunctive and largely non-monetary relief. The second group is committed and organized um, in their mission, and they're focusing on identifying and limiting DEI programs. Um, and so uh, we thought it was appropriate for us to talk about those programs that a lot of you have. The good news is that DEI programs are, remain lawful, um, but it really is critical to take the time now, review your existing initiatives and programs to ensure that they're legally compliant. So over the next 25 minutes or so, we will discuss some recent cases and developments as well as the risks that are related to um, common DEI programs and policies. And we will spend a couple of minutes discussing ways to mitigate the risks associated with a few programs that our clients have recently asked about. And so it's a lot to get into 30 minutes. So we'll go ahead and get started. Kate, if you can go to the next slide. Thank you. So speaking of an uptick in claims challenging DEI initiatives, uh, just a couple of months ago in April, the Supreme Court issued um, another decision with the potential of fundamentally shifting the landscape of DEI in employment. And that was a Muldrow case. In Muldrow, a police department moved a female sergeant from a plainclothes position um, that was in a specialized intelligence division into a uniformed position outside of intelligence uh, because the new commander wanted a male performer to, perf to perform kind of quote unquote dangerous work. Muldrow's rank and pay were unchanged as a result of that transfer, but the same could not be said of her responsibilities, the perks and schedule, and as well as her prestige. The court considered what level of harm an employee must show to base a Title VII claim on a job transfer and unanimously held that a plaintiff need only show that the employment action at issue would bring some harm with respect to a term or condition of employment. The ruling is significant um, because it's a, a drastic departure from prior Title VII jurisprudence in many circuits, which required a material harm um, be shown as a result of employment action. The impact of Muldrow on, on employment is a little bit unknown. Um, the case didn't provide a lot of guidance on what constitutes some harm other than stating that the harm need not be significant. 
but um, it does have a potential to affect a wide array of the corporate DEI programs that we're seeing there. For example, um, initiatives like mentorship or leadership development programs, which don't confer a specific job advantage to the participants of those programs. For example, there's not a promotion or a pay raise that goes along with that program. Um, undoubtedly confer less tangible benefits, such as fostering connections with leadership or developing, or developing um, key skills, which increases opportunities for advancement. And where these programs are limited to um, you know, individuals or folks of a certain race or gender to the exclusion of others, um, arguably those who are excluded could have a disadvantageous impact um, on their employment. So we expect to see challenges in this area over the coming months. And I'll uh, pass it off to Dave to talk about another case that recently came out. Yeah, thanks, Lauren. Um, so this is, um... A case that really just came out a couple of weeks ago, and it frankly is probably not getting quite the attention from the employer community that it deserves. Um, it's called the American Alliance for Equal Rights versus Fearless Fund, and it was an 11th Circuit decision that reversed uh, a, a denial of a preliminary injunction uh, against the um, the venture capital firm uh, Fearless Fund. Uh, the the Backing this this case on the part of the alliance is is Edward Blum, who uh, you may know famously as the attorney that drove the Harvard and UNC decisions that uh, in the DEI space, and then um, around the turn of the year went after a series of large law firms for their sort of uh, diversity scholarship programs uh, and recruiting programs that involve creating opportunities for. Um, for uh, disadvantaged or historically underrepresented groups in the legal profession. Uh, and, and in response, the three firms, uh, the large law firms in particular that Edward Blum went after, peeled back those programs and took away those sort of criteria from, from their, uh, whether it was a scholarship program or sort of a spotlighting program, they took away the requirement that you had to be a member of a disadvantaged or historically underrepresented group uh, with the pressure of those filings. Um, and and this uh, case also is backed by Edward Blum, and and here um, was successful in in getting the Eleventh Circuit uh, to to uh, grant the preliminary injunction uh, on the fund. So what was happening here? Fearless Fund is a venture capital fund that it was invest it invests in women of uh, color led businesses. And and the idea is that it is kind of bridging the gap between a, a sort of scarcity of, of uh, capital funding for minority owned businesses and specifically ran this contest where it would provide a $20,000 grant uh, to um, uh, uh, black women who are also 51% minority owners or 51% owners of, of a minority uh, business, um, color led businesses. And so, uh, it, it by its very terms, you had to be a, a black woman and running a business that uh, was 51% black woman owned in order to participate in this contest. Well, uh, that drew a challenge from this um, American Alliance for Equal Rights uh, group with some, um, as, as usual in these cases, some kind of, um, you know, uh, sort of phantom uh, disgruntled people, uh, presumably, you know, uh, white uh, uh, business owners or others who who the identity of whom was was kind of kept under wraps, not very not particularly clear, who claimed that they were um, not getting the opportunity to participate in this contest. They sued under Section 1981, which is an analogous uh, civil uh, civil rights statute to Title seven, but it is limited to race and only uh, focuses on race discrimination and the making and enforcing of contracts. It does apply in the employment space, but it also applies to any uh, business entities that may enter into contract together. Um, and uh, notably it has four year statute of limitations and no uh, exhaustion requirement before the EOC. So uh, interesting. You know, the fund argued in this case that that uh, these these sort of fictitiously injured people or these people who claim to have been injured lacked standing to bring uh, this claim. Uh, they claim there wasn't really a contract here. That was sort of quickly wiped away. The fact the contest described itself as a contract at some point. 
And then uh, they argued that as a private fund, uh, they have a First Amendment right to to expressive conduct and choosing to to you know want to support um, uh, women of color and to support um, uh, black owned businesses and and that they have a right uh, as a private fund to 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 exercise those uh, preferences. And and that argument actually carries sway at the district court level, and it's the same argument that the Eleventh Circuit spent a lot of time reversing. And for for the again, it's not an employment case, um, but but like a private employer, uh, there really are implications here in a number of ways. Um, you know, we often think in these programs, just as Lauren was describing, that that people who lose out on an opportunity to participate in a in a program or a or a scholarship program or uh, perhaps some kind of um, leadership training program, or are they really harmed? Uh, well, uh, this case strongly suggests that um, anybody who's uh, discriminated against on the basis of the color of their skin, regardless of the color of their skin, absolutely is harmed uh, and has standing to sue. This case was very clear about that. In fact, the, the, the dissenting opinion Tried to make an analogy to soccer players who who intentionally flop to draw a penalty, uh, you know, in, in sort of a false way, and and the, the majority really loudly sort of dismissed that notion and suggested that no, there's absolutely standing here to bring claims here, uh, and it's it's enough harm just to have been discriminated against or denied participation in in, in a program because of color of your skin. Um, they made uh, there's no problem finding a contract. Uh, and they went on to say that this is not a remedial program. You know, as you know, um, when you're putting together sort of a, on a voluntary affirmative action program and, and a remedial basis, you need to be able to demonstrate a manifest imbalance. Um, and, and while that may have been here uh, or may be here upon, you know, further exploration, um, that program can't unnecessarily trample the rights of others or create an absolute bar. And the 11th Circuit said, well, this is an absolute bar. You may not participate unless you are uh, a black woman. And so by its uh, very definition, it, it, it can't possibly meet that standard. Uh, they went on to reject the First Amendment argument and draw this super fine distinction between what they described as advocating um, uh, advocating race discrimination rather than practicing race discrimination. And, and they spent time on a case you may remember that 303 creative case with the website designer who refused to design a website for a same sex marriage. It was a, a, a web creator who created sort of marriage sites, wouldn't do it for a same sex couple. And, and the Supreme Court, the United States said that's okay because she has a first amendment right to refuse, um, to, to take a position on same-sex marriage it wasn't comfortable uh, taking. I think it was a, maybe a right of religion or, or speech or both. Uh, and they drew a distinction between uh, not being required to kind of express a view or make a statement that you didn't believe in and the denial of service. And that um, in that case, the, the person said, well, of course, I'm happy to work with anyone, but I won't put a message out there that I don't, you know, that's inconsistent with my First Amendment. Uh, rights and so um, this this case sort of drew that similar distinction, sort of in a troubling way to suggest that well, it's one thing for you to um, espouse a position on the importance of minority-owned business getting funding, but it's another thing to deny access, you know, to to um, white participants, and they and they struck it um, on that basis or, or imposed the injunction. Now this is not the merits. This is just an injunction. You know, the standard is that they. They're kind of looking to see whether there's a likelihood of, of success on the merits. We haven't gotten to the merits, but this will be an important case to watch, uh, assuming it gets to the merits. And this injunction uh, process may get appealed to the Supreme Court as well. But again, it's a case that's quite new, two weeks, so we wanted to spend a little time on it. Just came out two weeks ago and um, pr probably not getting the attention it deserves from the uh, employer community, given the implications for sort of private employers. Um, in in the, in the space, and and we'll make mention of this when we talk about some DEI specifics in the coming minutes. I can go to the next slide and the next speaker. I think Liz, right? Yes. Um. So, so 
Title VII has always um, operated to place some limitations on what employers can do in the DEI space um, because these initiatives are typically related to protected characteristics like race or gender. Um, and because of that relationship, all DEI programs exist along a spectrum of risk, um, which is kind of exhibited in this um, image on the screen here. Now, the level of risk that's associated with a particular initiative depends on two things. And the first thing is how close the tie is between the protected trait and an employment decision, and whether the initiative affects a benefit or privilege of employment. Now, the closer the tie to the protected, the tie between the protected trait and the employment decision, the higher the risk. So um, these decisions that are on the left side of the screen are um, less tethered to the uh, protected trait and um, the ones on the right side are more closely aligned with a tangible employment action. Um, also, the more likely an initiative, um, uh, the more likely initiative is to result um, in a change to a benefit or privilege of employment, the higher the risk as well. Now, um, because the Muldrow opinion, as Lauren mentioned, was just issued just two months ago, we really don't know how it's gonna play out, but um, it does give employees more arguments to make challenges to DEI efforts that are traditionally less risky. We can also see how Muldrow and the Fearless Fund case could be read together to give employees more sure footing to make arguments challenging those same traditionally less risky DEI initiatives. Next slide, please. And as we mentioned, we're gonna walk through uh, just a few DEI programs. And as we walk through these various initiatives, it's important to keep in mind that um, details are very important in the execution of any DEI program. Um, we can easily shift from a program that's low risk over here in the upper left quadrant to um, a moderately risky one simply by the way that an employer chooses to discuss an initiative or um, the, the, the way it chooses to roll it out. So just keep that in mind as we're discussing these various initiatives. Um, next slide, please. And so now we're going to get kind of into like the, the nuts and bolts of this a little bit. On this slide, you see um, some examples of programmings that are typically um, low risk, don't really pose uh, much of an issue for employers. Um, they uh, incorporate DEI concepts, but they don't expressly or implicitly motivate leaders to make employment decisions because of a protected trait. So things like analytics that are just studies that evaluate demographic metrics aren't tethered to any employment decision. They typically have little risk. Things like anti-harassment and anti-discrimination training, um, just to educate workforces about how not to violate discrimination laws, not going to pose a risk and obviously mitigates other legal risks that employers have to be worried about. Um, inclusive leadership training or just training materials that encourage leaders to make an effort to understand other cultures and um, different beliefs that differ from what they their own experiences and then use that new perspective to promote a more inclusive work environment. Typically not very risky unless an employer would then use that training to make an employment decision based on race or gender or any other protected characteristic. Um, same goes for all these other inclusive job postings, targeted um, job postings and partnership collaborations. One thing I do want to flag about implicit bias training, um, I do want to encourage our employers to thoroughly vet the content of their implicit bias, tra implicit bias training. We have seen a few cases where white employees have brought hostile work environment claims because they were required to attend a training that included discussion of topics that can be uh, sensitive, like white privilege, white fragility, white supremacy, et cetera. And um, we haven't seen these cases get much traction in the courts. Um, they, they were dismissed at the motion to dismiss stage because the plaintiff wasn't able to allege that it was a sufficiently severe or pervasive um, harassment. Um, but of course, litigation is an expense that we want to keep in mind in assessing risk. And we also want to avoid using materials that arguably cut against um, company inclusivity goals overall. Um, next slide. Yeah, so these um, are, uh, I, I suppose any of these risks, including the low risk things, could still be executed poorly. Um, and, and likewise, as we move down the spectrum here, um, you know, this is it's generally regarded to be somewhat safe territory, but I suppose any of them um, 
could get fouled up. Uh, so, for example, um, you know, scholarship programs, um, you know, just mentioned the, the, the law firms that had scholarship programs in place that were exclusive to particular groups. Um, they had an argument in their case that because they were referring to underrepresented groups, it didn't necessarily mean that they were referring to race. Um, nevertheless, they disbanded those programs when challenged. Um, if you're doing a scholarship program, uh, you know, you want to make sure that it uh, consistent with what we learned from Fearless Fund. You want to make sure it's not, um, it doesn't bar entry to someone, uh, to, to, to groups and is, is open, at least theoretically, you know, to, to all comers. Um, we could spend a lot of time, um, you know, you'll hear on successive slides reference to these uh, DEI workforce aspirational goals. And of course, you know, uh, the goals must be aspirational. They ideally would be at a high level. Um, in, a, in a perfect world, they would not be kind of across the board, um, but, but sort of more targeted or more strategic where you really were sort of addressing under certain underrepresented parts or areas of the business or certain jobs uh, within your business rather than kind of an across the board cut. Um, and, and, you know, but of course, as you get closer to numbers, uh, must stay away from quotas, but you'll hear on successive slides, you know, how that risk temperature goes up. Um, uh, employee resource groups are going to be the subject of, of coming micro series sessions in their entirety. So we're going to stay away from talking about those for a while. And you see the rest of the, uh, ideas on this screen, um, cultural competency workshops are something that we're seeing a, a lot, um more of recently, especially with um, what, we, what we refer to in our firm as sort of cultural flashpoint issues that are becoming um, uh, a, a real challenge for employers these days. The, the opportunity to kind of teach, to educate. Um, uh, we do something in our firm, which I think is great, is that, you know, every holiday for of any kind of group or anything that's coming up, we, we make a real effort to kind of explain and uh, what the holiday is and why it's important to the particular group who's part of it and 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 literally just educate uh, everyone in the firm about you know the importance of of given holidays or upcoming events uh, or certain times of year and why they're important to some of the people um, you know in our world here at the firm so it's it's a real way to kind of promote inclusion and education um, in a positive way uh, next slide Thanks, Dave. Um, so Dave just touched on kind of when discussing the fearless fund key case and the recent litigation related to law firms, diversity scholarship programs that, um, uh, that there's a shift here going that that's happening. There's a heightened risk when it comes to exclusive programs, um, exclusive diversity programs, especially those that have some kind of tangible employment benefit. So the mentorship and scholarship programs, internship programs, supplier programs, and even leadership development initiatives. And kind of as Liz was talking about, when you read these cases together, the Muldrow case and the fearless fund case, um, you can see how, how that risk might be moving along the spectrum. Um, Dave just talked about this a bit, but tying compensation to DEI hiring or promotional goals, you know, our recommendation really is to keep these goals aspirational. Do not tie these goals to performance ratings or financial incentives. Um, we did just want to spend a couple of minutes. I know we're running short here on time, but on diverse slate requirements, because that is something we're hearing from clients. You know, they have questions about that. So, as we know, the purpose of um, encouraging diverse slates is to increase diversity of the candidate pool um, and including the diversity of those who are interviewed. Um, at the same time, like, we really need to be sure that we're making those selection decisions and hiring choices. Um, in a way that's free from bias and that we're really selecting at all times, you know, the most qualified candidate, not using race, gender, or any other protected category or characteristic as a decision, a decisional criteria. Um, which, of course, means that race and gender may not serve as a, like a plus factor or a tiebreaker or any other basis for making the hiring decision. So, when sourcing your candidates and constructing a policy around diverse slates, um, we would make a couple of recommendations. The first is that while any role benefits from consideration of diverse candidates, and while we appreciate that you, there's an overall um, wish to increase 
the, the diverse representation of, of employees in corporate roles, some roles might be well represented already by women and people of color. And, and for those positions, a diverse slate goal might not be warranted or practical. Um, at the same time, kind of the inverse of that is that you should be less tolerant when, um, when you know, of the idea of relaxing those diverse slate goals when it comes to underrepresented roles. Second, we would remind you just kind of like we just did a couple of times that these goals are aspirational. It's important not to tie them um, to any kind of financial incentive um, that's aimed at achieving the goal. Third, um, even when you're having difficulty achieving a diverse slate of interviewees, you should not pass through any candidates who did not pass prior screening rounds. Remember really the, the point here is to select the most qualified candidate without using any of those protected categories. So we don't want that to be seen as like a plus factor or you know th that was a factor and somehow got them past a screening that they wouldn't otherwise have um, made it through. Uh, the fourth tip is that we um, that we would recommend you not artificially cap or limit the number of candidates that you're willing to interview for a role. So look at this as making the pie bigger, right? As opposed to having smaller slices. Um, so the, the process should be additive. Um, and the, in the end, you know, we're just interviewing more folks instead of swapping people out. And then the last recommendation we'd make around this is um, in situations where a slate is perceived to be kind of not diverse enough, right? Not insufficiently diverse. Do not take any shortcuts or change your your process or your sourcing approach to address that situation. You should maintain a wide, inclusive, broad lens and be prepared to interview more candidates, right, with that additive approach. All right, next slide. And on this slide, these are examples of initiatives that are unacceptable. Um, in any circumstance. Um, these categories, these are programs that either clearly make employment decisions on the basis of an employee's protected characteristic or their initiatives that could be misconstrued or um, construed either way to instruct leaders to consider protected traits in employment decisions. Now, there has been a lot of movement in this area, but the law hasn't changed here on this. Title VII has always um, prohibited uh, making employment decisions on the basis of a protected trait. And in all likelihood, it always will. So we need to stay away from, from doing that. Um, an employer's rationale for making a decision based on a protected trait, no matter how benevolent it is, um, doesn't change the fact that we're treating people differently on the basis of race, gender, sexual orientation, religion, et cetera. So just keep that baseline rule in mind when you're um, structuring your programs and that will keep you um, on the right side of wrong. And so just some examples um, that I do wanna highlight that are obvious, like racial or gender stereotyping, ignoring merit-based criteria. Um, those are things that should be you know, covered in our anti-harassment, um, anti-discrimination training as obvious no-nos. Um, and quotas are, are always wrong as we've talked about, you know, these aspirational goals repeatedly. Obviously a quota goes one step further and makes it a requirement. Um, we wanna stay away from that as well. And um, where it gets kind of slippery and then again, Muldrow and um, Fearless Fund come in are making race or gender conscious employment decisions. Um, Muldrow has the, the likelihood um, for, plaintiff's attorneys to try to sweep a whole lot of um, employment decisions and employment actions into that into that um, that context. So we really want to be careful um, in, in making those decisions that are traditionally less tethered to ultimate employment decisions like hiring and promotion. So um, I think that's all that we have. Um, next slide, I want to get to the part we've all been waiting for, the CLE code. Um, which is SS, as in Seifarth Shaw, 6872. SS, Seifarth Shaw, 6872. And you can also just scan the QR code right here. And um, as Kate said earlier, you can also get the information in your confirmation email from this morning. And so now I will turn it over to any questions that we have? That did and Dave then, answer any questions? Yeah, there's a couple of questions that have come in. I, we don't have a lot of time, obviously. I, someone asked whether selective training or development programs includes the kind of leadership development programs that are intended or designed for a certain race or other underrepresented group. And I think that's exactly what we mean. You know, that 
those programs have become popular lately. Um, and I think they're um, in this heightened kind of risk environment. I think I'd be very careful with a program that is targeting exclusively a particular demographic or closed to just certain, um, you know, whether it's uh, uh, women only, black only group or cohort, you know, through a leadership development program. I think um, is that this is not the time to roll such a program out, you know, uh, for private employers. Um, uh, We've gotten some other uh, good questions here. I think what we'll end up doing, uh, we are we are sharing the slides and we'll we'll circulate um, other questions that we've received, or if you uh, want to fire them in before we close, uh, we'll we'll get some answers out to some of those questions in writing uh, as a follow up. Thanks everybody uh, for your time. These micro webinars are so named for a reason, only a half hour, but hopefully uh, was helpful. And please join us for the rest of the of the series. Um, uh, coming up soon. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.